Hi guys, tonight we are going to do our first flipped notes lesson of our astronomy unit. You can go ahead in your composition notebooks and put the date and title it Astronomy Flipped Notes. Everything in red you guys can copy down into your composition notebooks. Tonight we are going to be focusing on stars and star formation. So we talked a little bit about stars in class and this is a great way to launch our astronomy unit because as I said this is one of the best ways to view astronomy. It's one of the easiest um, because we can see the stars at night. So our definition of a star is a sphere of nuclear fusion. We learned about nuclear fusion in our radioactivity unit and it is held together by its own gravity, although that gravity changes throughout the life cycle of the star. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So capital letter A is life cycle of stars. Now we did a little bit of this in class, so I'll catch you up real quickly and give you some vocab that we went over already, and then we'll continue all the way through to the death of a star. So just a little recap, where are stars born? That beautiful image below is a picture of a, you got it, Nebula, or the plural of nebula, as I always mess up, is nebulae. So a nebula, nebulae, is um, a cloud of dust and gas where stars are born. And here are some of those beautiful pictures that we looked at in class of our Eagle Nebula. You can see the one in the upper right-hand corner there is a picture of the visual spectrum. And then the bottom one is enhanced using different types of telescopes that we talked about. There's a beautiful horse head and then the Omega Nebula. Now after that nebula begins to contract, so something's got to get that dust and gas moving, it starts to swirl, and our next stage before we turn into that burning ball of nuclear fusion, um, first we start as our protostar, proto meaning before, and you can remember that uh, if you think about a prototype, it's not the final draft, it's what you build before you make your final version of something. And our protostar is when gravity causes all that matter to contract within the nebula and it condenses. When it condenses, those particles are bumping into each other more, they're gaining energy. As they bump into each other, that friction is making the temperature rise, um, and they're interacting with each other a lot. And this is a positive feedback cycle. It builds and builds and builds until it continues to rise, and those uh, nuclei of my hydrogen atoms are no longer repulsed um, by that electric repulsive force, and they fuse together. And this is when we enter our next stage, and this is what we have not talked about yet. You learned a little bit, it, a little about, a little about it in class during our virtual star lab. Um, but we have our main sequence star. So this is where stars spend the majority of their life cycle. So A is when nuclear fusion occurs, our star is born, and during our main sequence we're burning hydrogen and we're turning it into helium. So that's during our main sequence. Energy from the nuclear reactions is emitted in a variety of ways. So we call it electromagnetic radiation, and that's heat, light, UV, X-ray, and gamma ray. So there's all sorts of energy, not just the energy that we see with our naked eye when we go outside at night. Now, a main sequence star stays together throughout its main sequence because of something called hydrostatic equilibrium. So that's a big fancy word, but if you just look at the second part of the word equilibrium and you think, what does that mean, equal? Well, it means that there's a balance. So there's a balance of forces in the star, and the two forces are the outward gas pressure. So if you think of, you know, watching any of those action flicks on TV and there's a big gas explosion, that's what's happening That's what's happening inside the star, and it uh, produces an outward force. But there's also a lot of mass in the star, and because there's mass, you have this attractive force that holds that explosion together. So this balance between these two forces keeps my star in equilibrium, although that equilibrium shifts as we move through main sequence, but that's what keeps the star together. Okay, so there's different types of main sequence stars. So number four, types of main sequence stars. And what we're going to look at now is how the life cycle of the star is dependent on the size of the star. So the amount of mass within my main sequence star 
determines what's going to happen as it moves through its life cycle. And there's three kinds, and you don't have to write this part down yet because we're going to look at each one individually. But we have ones we call sun-like stars, and those are actually our small stars, believe it or not. Our sun is very small compared to most stars out there in the sky. We have our medium mass star, and then we have our large mass star. And these are these are massed compared to our sun. So here's a little diagram that I'll just walk you through real quick before we move on to definitions of these. So we all start here in the left in our stellar nursery, that's our nebula. After our star forms, if we go up and follow this arrow right here, we're looking at our sun-like stars. They go from main sequence, which is right here, over to red giant, then they explode outwards into a planetary nebula. It's not a very big explosion. The core of the star left behind right here is my white dwarf, and that slowly burns away and turns into a black dwarf. So a white dwarf is like a really, really tiny star. It gives off just a little bit of light, and then a black dwarf you can't see. If you go from our stellar nursery and you turn into a bigger main sequence star, so this is 1.5 to 3 times the mass of our sun, when you go from main sequence stage to red giant stage, you actually are called a red supergiant. They like to use very technical terms in astronomy. The red supergiant obviously being bigger than the red giant because you have that super in front of it. After our supergiant, you go into what's called a supernova, which is similar to a planetary nebula, but it's much more catastrophic. The center of the star is left behind as a neutron star, and we'll talk more about these in a minute. And then last but not least, when you're really, really big, those are my giant stars, you still turn into a red giant, you still go through a supernova, but what's left at the center of where that star used to be is a black hole. Okay, so now we'll get this into our notes. So our sun-like stars, are we'll consider them low mass. They're going to be up to 1.5 times the mass of the sun. They go through the main sequence stage. And this is where our sun is right now. They then turn into a red giant. When they turn into a red giant, if you look at this picture down here, here's our main sequence stage. When they turn into a red giant, look what happens to the size of the star. It increases dramatically when it goes into the red giant phase. And this is because as we go from main sequence to red giant, we use up all of our hydrogen fuel and we start burning our helium fuel. And that equilibrium that we talked about is lost. When that equilibrium is lost, the size of the star increases dramatically as it starts to burn the helium fuel. When that happens, unfortunately, for us, with our sun, um, the size of the sun is going to increase a lot and it's going to engulf the inner planets. So that's a little scary, but luckily astronomers estimate that's only going to happen in about 7.5 billion years. So we've got some time left. We then move into our planetary nebula. Um, which is the death of a star, and we talked about in class how the nice um, circularness of a nebula is it's the birth and death place of a star. So that planetary nebula then is going to have a white dwarf at its core, which will then slowly turn into a black dwarf. Now sun-like stars you can think of as um, uh, really conservative in terms of fuel use. Um, they live for billions of years because they burn their fuel really slowly. And another way to remember that is just think of our sun like a Prius. That's how I like to equate it to our Prius. So we've got lots and lots of time. You can take your Prius out on the highway and drive for long distances before you have to fuel up again. Okay, let's move on to our medium mass. 1.5 to 3 times the mass of the sun. When it goes through that main sequence to red giant phase, it's the same exact equilibrium that's lost, except now we're a super giant because we're that much bigger. Now, after we move through our super giant phase, this is when we've burned up all of our fuel. Because we're so much bigger, that equilibrium, when it's lost, it creates this massive explosion called a supernova, and we call it a catastrophic explosion of the outer layers of the star. Now, the cool thing about supernova is that they happen very quickly. Most things in astronomy 
don't happen very quickly. They take place over billions, millions of years. Supernovas can take place very quickly, and you can actually see them um, in a telescope, and many have been viewed through history. It's believed that the first one that was viewed was over 10,000 years ago, um, and astronomers were able to... Uh, use information from space to predict that this supernova um, was absolutely huge and lit up the night sky. And there are Bolivian hieroglyphics that some historians believe chronicle this event, which is kind of cool. Now, when you have your medium mass star and it dies after supernova, the center of it left behind is called a neutron star. And it's basically just an extremely dense star. Now, some cool facts about neutron stars is that they're so dense that the protons and electrons fuse together to make neutrons. And a teaspoon of it would weigh about 10,000, I'm sorry, 10 trillion tons. So that would be 10 trillion bison, uh, just to give you a reference point there. Just one little teaspoon of it. That's how dense it is. The matter is packed so closely together. And they're actually very, very small in size. They think they're only about, I mean, depends on the neutron star, but some estimates are only about 12 miles across. So, you know, that's the size of a small city. Um, but think of all that matter smushed into that tiny little space. Medium mass stars you can think of as kind of a mid-sized SUV. They burn their fuel much faster than smaller stars, and they only last in main sequence for a few million years. Okay, last but not least, we've got our large mass stars. They're more than three times the mass of the sun. They go from red giant to supernova, and because they're so much bigger, that center has so much more matter packed into it, we get a black hole. And that's going to be our definition, a region of space where gravity pulls in all matter. And there's different sizes of black holes. Some are really small. They think are only about the size of an atom. Some um, are uh, about 20 times the size of our sun. Those are called stellar black holes. And then there's super massive ones, which they believe are about a million times the mass of our sun. Um, in, I'm sorry, volume, in terms of size. So uh, black holes, you can't see them because they pull in all light. The, way, the reason we know that they exist is because they affect other objects. They affect other objects around them. Um, so the way that stars act when they're near a black hole is they give off this high energy light. And that um, indicates to astronomers that they can pinpoint the location of a black hole from that. Our large mass stars burn their fuel really quickly, and they only last um, only like 100,000 years, which when you compare that to billions of years is quite fast. So you can compare that to that nice big wheel truck right there. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about how we track the life cycle of a star, and we do it using something called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and here's a picture of it right here, and we'll get back to this in a minute. Our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram shows the magnitude and temperature of various life stages of different stars. So we classify the stars in these classes right here, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And you're going to need to know those classes, and I'm going to give you a little mnemonic device in a minute. And we look at how their temperature changes from class to class. You can see it's cooling as we go down from O all the way to M, and then our color maps out with our temperature blue all the way down to red. So blue is going to be our hottest, and if you think of a flame um, on your grill, for instance, the hottest part of the flame is going to be right next to where the gas comes out, and that's blue, and then it moves all the way down to red as it cools off. Now, if we look back at this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, um, and we'll do play a little bit, play around with this a little bit more in class, this is my main sequence stage right here. So as, sun, as stars move through their main sequence, they move like this. Then they're going to bounce up to either red giant or red supergiant. And then when they turn into our red giants, when they turn into white dwarfs, they shoot over here. So the life cycle kind of bounces around a little bit. It doesn't go um, just in one direction. 
Okay, so our temperature and color of a star tell us a lot. The color of a star indicates the temperature of the star. So you can look at the color and say, okay, you look up into the sky, you see a bright blue star, you think, oh, Vega, that must be an early stage star. If you look up and you see a red star like Betelgeuse, and uh, some people say Betelgeuse, I like Betelgeuse, that's a red star, um, you know that that's towards the end of its life cycle. So we classify stars by their temperature decreasing from bright to dim, and here are our classes. So decreasing from brightest are our O's all the way down to M. And to remember these classes, because it's nice to know, especially for your um, constellation projects, when you look up the stars in your constellation, oh, if it's a K class or an O class, you can compare your stars in terms of their life cycle. My mnemonic is, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. Um, and that's the one I learned. That's the one that you see in most textbooks, but feel free to change it around. You can write, oh, be a fine guy, kiss me, or you can come up with something else altogether. It's up to you guys. Okay, color and temperature can affect size. So you'll see here with my O, as I move through main sequence, what's happening to my size? I'm decreasing because I'm using up all that fuel. So my outward gas pressure is decreasing, which means gravity is pulling my star smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is main sequence. And then what happens after M is I explode outwards into my giant, either red giant or red super giant stage of the star. Okay, we're almost done here. Number three is my brightness. We have three ways of measuring the brightness of a star. The first one is called absolute magnitude, and this looks at just the visible light coming off of celestial objects. And if you look on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, you'll see that the more negative it is, the greater. Next is luminosity. Luminosity looks at all of the energy that comes off of it, and it compares it to the energy given off by our sun. So you could be two times greater than our sun or five times greater than our sun in terms of luminosity. And then last but not least is what we see from Earth, apparent magnitude. You can look at the word apparent and remember appear, how it appears to us. And it's how bright a star appears to be from Earth. And think about why some stars might appear to be bigger. We learned that our sun is actually pretty small, but it looks pretty bright to us. Think about why that might be. Again, here's our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So let's finish by comparing my blue and my red giant. So which one is younger, my blue giant or my red giant? So we'll look at our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Our blue one, because it's blue, so it's hotter. It hasn't cooled down yet. How about temperature? Ooh, I think I just gave that one away. Here's my Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. You got it, the blue one is hotter. And last but not least, which one is more luminous? So you can see here, it's my blue and my red. Here's luminosity increasing. There's about our sun right there. So we're increasing in this direction. Our blue one is more luminous. Okay, bring your notes to class and we'll talk more about this when we're all done.